There you go. I won't say anything illegal. <laughs> You're okay, man. No, I've been doing good. Uh, you know, after I left Dan's and moved back back to Ohio, uh, uh -huh. my own studio up, and I've been doing that for the past four, four and a half years now. Yeah, I know. Well, I see your posts every now and again, you know, see what you're up to. You do a, a kind of a mixture of all kinds of different things, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm um, trying to do like a, a content creation type of studio. Um, okay. Obviously, still doing the traditional recordings and stuff, but... Um, we're doing a lot of podcast hosting. Um, we're doing some live performance. Well, we're testing out the live performance stuff, stream right. a whole nother world. But we've yeah. been trying to test that out and doing some in-house yeah. live performances and stuff like that. So oh, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Good stuff. Good stuff. So how did the podcast thing come about? Well, you know, I started podcasting back in like uh 2005, 2006. Really? Wow, I didn't know that. It was video. Right. Um, so I started doing some of that um, where I was just kind of uh, getting a bunch of bands. I was more like a radio station where okay. I was getting bands, you know, and sending me their music for me to to listen to and then play on my podcast. Um, uh -huh. But I, I saw how popular it had been getting over the you know past few years, and right. it would be a good idea to start our own channel and try to build up that uh, that that platform. All right. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't do one myself, but um, I listen to kind of a varied amount, you know, some of it on um, sport because um, I'm an avid uh, rugby fan. Um, and right. I play, I've started playing again as well. Really? Ah. I'm playing. Yeah. So um, I actually broke my ankle playing <laughs> this year. <laughs> okay. <All> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah one of that you know it, it, it you know it was an unfortunate accident it's one of those things um guy broke his wrist the other night when we were playing you know it's just it's one of those things um but um no you know so it, 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 i listen to kind of very kind of types you know but not many on music i have to say yeah, so. there, there's a f only a few that I listen to that are on about music, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, I mean, when you're doing music all day, I guess that's the last thing you want to listen. Listen. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Pe people moaning about how they're not making any money out of streaming and that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Endless. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the article in it was in Music Week and it was in. Um, uh, Rolling Stone, that basically the big four, uh, you know, streamers. So it was at Apple. Uh, d d oh, what's the other? Uh, Chris Martin's one. Anyway, the big four, Spotify yeah. and all this kind of stuff, um, decided and Yahoo that they were uh, YouTube. They weren't going to increase the payments to songwriters and the maximum that they could foresee that was a good business model for them was only 12%, 12 and a half percent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Exactly. So, you know, um, I saw it came uh, out. It was like last, last year, 20, uh, 49 billion was made in yeah. the music industry and artists only got 12 and a half percent of that. Yeah. Right. So, um, strange that, you know, that, the the, the, the they would see it right to strangle the people that give them their product. I don't really understand that. Anyway, I won't go into it at depth, but yeah, it's, it amazes me. Yeah. 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 That's the other thing we've been working on also. Um, I've been getting into coding. Um, oh, okay. Crypto. Okay. Um, and NFTs. Okay. NFTs being. Uh, non fungible tokens. Um, it's okay. a new, new way of releasing art, digital art, physical art, uh -huh. music. Uh, okay. Not a lot of uh, not a lot of musicians are are hip to it yet. Mm. Um, okay, I've never heard of it actually. So there but, you go. No, no. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, an NFT is basically a smart contract. Yeah. That's co that's coded. 
and it's mm -hmm. on the blockchain. The same thing as like uh, Bitcoin, okay. right? Right. Uh, so with the smart contract, you can basically say, you know, create whatever contract terms you want want in it. So, um, for example, a, a rapper recently, Tory Lanez. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, huge rapper. He's probably got ten mm. million follow, you know, fans, whatnot. He was signed to a major deal, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, he kind of got blocked from all that because he did some negative stuff. So he decided he was going to release his recent seven song EP album right on the cusp there um, with seven separate pieces of art as an NFT. So they, okay. could, um, and then you retain a royalty of this NFT when it sells. Okay. Uh, um, when it resells. All right. Okay. Yeah. So an NFT is kind of like a stock. So he created 1 million of these and made them avail available for his fans for a dollar. And they sold in 57 seconds, all million <laughs> of them. And then they were reselling mm. for 30 to a hundred thousand dollars a couple of days later to his other fans who didn't have the opportunity to get the limited amount of pieces that were out there. Right. I see. And uh, so he reached, he got, got a royalty based off all those resales. Those resales. Right. So as long as it continues to resell as a, uh, like a piece of art would resell, um, mm. the, the artist will retain a royalty. Okay, so, and then it, obviously because it's all as like a cryptocurrency, um, it's all in the blockchain, as you say, they know exactly where it's going and who's buying it and for how much. And so the, the I don't know how he would get his remuneration probably in cryptocurrency, I don't know, but it would then oh, automatically go to, yeah, yeah. Oh, clever, yeah, clever, yeah. Good idea. That's, that's, contract, his wallet address is there. So every time there's a sale, it automatically yeah. makes that split and sends it to his yeah. account. Yeah. Okay. So he's, has he uh, bought his new Maserati yet? Or I mean, is he just. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually think he teamed up with a uh, NFT marketing, uh, a marketplace yeah. online and um, teamed up to market this, this release. Okay. So what we're doing here at our studio is my team is yeah. trying to develop a uh, NFT streaming and marketplace website. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. So so how what your with your podcast then what what you just kind of talking about what's going on or you just yeah we just kind of talk about um, music we talk about like your your music producer obviously and I want to talk mm -hmm. about you know your career how you got got into music you know all the crap that you've heard over the past you know 30 years same same yeah. same stuff <laughs> podcast oh, all, I, don't, I don't mind i mean you know I, i'm not very I'm, I'm not very good at self-promotion but when um you know the opportunity you know comes up and particularly when i've you know when friends call me and say you fancy doing this then sure you know um I do so appreciate just, it very much, your time. I know it's no, fine. man, it's fine. It's fine. I've just had dinner. I'm having a cup of tea. You know what I mean? It's fine. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I roll. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just fire questions at me, man. You know, just right, well, whatever you want to know, really. You know, let me introduce you. Uh, Steve Lyon, music producer of the UK. Um, is that correct? That well, is correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that you you have a studio based in uh, is it London? It's and in yeah, it's in London. Uh, the studio is called Panic Button Studios. Right, right. And it and it's actually on a uh, kind of a dream location. It's on an island in the middle of the River Thames. Oh wow! Um, the island is not mine, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, it's an old military, uh, kind of semi-military um, establishment, like built like 80, 90 years ago. Wow. Um, and uh, it was used to, used to build like landing craft and little submarines and stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyway, so it's been used for all kinds of different uh, things. There's all kinds of units on the, on the on the island, and I was just very fortunate uh, to find it uh, ten years ago now, 
and um, just by a happy accident, I didn't even know the island existed. It's in my area. I just didn't even know it was there. It's kind of hidden away further down the Thames from where I live. And um, so, yeah, I just, you know, I can't do anything to the outside of the building because it's a protected building. Right. Um, but I can kind of do what I want on the inside. So I just kind of took over this uh, studio um, that someone had tried to put together and, um, you know, knocked a few holes in walls and set up my gear. And that was about it really. <laughs> um, and it works. It's cool. It's, it's, um, it, it's, I don't, I, I mean, I, I flip backwards and forwards between Italy in Rome and right. London. Right. Right. Um, so, um, you know, it's always, really nice to be back there um and i missed it obviously in the covid time you know it was difficult uh and we're still going through the covid time it's not over yet but uh no it's cool so uh, yeah I, I base myself there but i mean obviously now so much work gets done in the box in the computer um i can literally kind of work from anywhere right um and during covid i did um you know remote recording which is interesting. Um, how, did because, that, you know, how did you do that? Was that through Zoom or? or... Well, no, I did, basically. Or had, uh, you, had you tracked? I, 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 I kind of just talked to the musicians and I was like, right, you know, I've called you for a reason. So I'm not going to tell you how to play drums. I'm going to tell you how to play guitar. But this is how I see this song. This is how I kind of see it coming about. Okay. You know, can you knock something together? And um, I had to say I had a pretty good success rate where I'd say kind of, 85 90 percent of what they did i liked okay and then the other you know percent i guess they, they were good enough to kind of go okay well you know you want a different inversion or you want it done like this or different kind of riff or um so that worked on a couple of projects um and then i did another project where it was literally i did everything apart from the vocals, not in a studio. Um, so it was all programmed and um, played, uh, not all by me, but pretty much by me. Um, and uh, that kind of worked out really well. Again, you're just working with musicians that you know that you can trust and people that I like. Right. So, um, and, you know, working now, you know, as you know, right? So working in the box as they like to call it um is just so different to where we started from yeah yeah it's, it's, it's a lot different plus but like you said is you can work anywhere and, it, and it's not too hard to plug in into a, a, a studio and use some of their outboard gear and and kind of get back into that feeling again you know yeah um I, I still I still kind of think it's a bit weird that my world is in in the laptop you know and uh, when I when I'm in my studio or you know I take my computer basically to other studios because I've got all my bits and pieces in there <laughs> so much easier that way um, between my my laptop and my hard disk and then I just plug in a couple of cables and bang you know there it is it's, yeah. it's, it's like it shouldn't really work but it does um, <laughs> it's very frustrating when suddenly it doesn't work. Um, right. But um, yeah, you know, it, it obviously for family life as well and just personal life, it's, it's just, uh, it's cool because you can kind of divide your day up, you know, a bit right. differently, but I do miss, you know, I'd, I'd obviously, you know, in the studio, I was in the studio, um, my place about a week ago and, you know, full band and, you know, five people like hammering away, you know, yeah, yeah. there's nothing quite like that. Right. You know, that's right. just the best. Um, and to be, you know, at, at, at that, um, to be sitting behind the glass and watching skilled people do go about it. It's brilliant. Right. Yeah. So, so let's, let's take it back for a second. What got you involved in um, becoming a music producer? I mean, were you a musician in bands before, prior to that, or how, how did that evolution oh. Well, I'll take it back a little bit further than that. I mean, I, I'm actually not, I don't really class myself as a musician. Uh, in fact, I'm not a musician because, I mean, if I was to stand around four, five people jamming, I'd kind of pick up a tambourine or a triangle or something, you know, is that, 
you don't want to hear me play guitar. <laughs> I but, but I right. So I'm good at like, oh, can you do it like this? You know, or can you, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. stand in front of people and wave a lot. Um, but I I'd always, when I started collecting, like buying singles when I was like eight, well, seven or eight years old. Um, and then my cousin had a really big, vinyl collection so i remember going around to his house and making up tapes you know a bit like the high fidelity movie you know going around and making up compilation tapes and stuff um and i always thought well actually i like so many different types of music that i don't actually want to be in a band because you know that, that's a bit boring just play the same music all the time i don't do that <laughs> um and i was much more into the technical side Although I didn't really know what that was, but I just, I just, I guess I just like the lights, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's how I started, and I, I did um, got involved with the, you know, like bands in my area, a um, couple of small venues, and I went on tour with like folk bands, and I did some festivals and things like this when I was still at college, and then um, I went to the National Film and TV School. Right. which is just outside of London uh, by, again, a happy accident. Um, my grandmother worked in a, in a film studios and, you know, just met a few people and that was it. So I just went along for free just to kind of get some experience. And I met someone there whose boyfriend was being produced by Glyn Johns. And Glyn Johns is kind of famous for the Who. He worked with the Beatles uh, John Hyatt, uh, um, John Armour Trading, um, Clapton, the Eagles, very famously for the Eagles, the first they did the first Led Zepp album, mm -hmm. um, and his brother Andy Johns also, who sadly passed away, but he did um, Zepp as well. But anyway, so I just literally I went to his house, uh, kind of peeing myself basically because i was like my god you know he's like he was and still is my production guru i mean right um i just loved what he did and um i loved his records and he was just really understanding and just went okay you don't really know what one end of a mic lead looks like from another but that doesn't really matter right um you know you just sit on the chair and you watch and I did that for about two years, uh, various products, uh, various productions that he was involved with. And just, I didn't realize at the time that even then, so we're talking like 85, 86. I didn't realize at the time that he was still working in a semi old school way because it was my first experience in a proper studio. So I just thought everyone did it like he did. Right. And he had, um, do you remember the old Helios console? Have you ever seen that? Kind yeah. of looked like, you know, like the NASA yeah. control room and it was kind of a semi-circular thing and it had the big joysticks on it and everything. So he had kind of designed his own console, um, which ergonomically to an engineer was just like made absolute sense. Um, so all the meters are in the middle. Everything's kind of like up in front of you, EQs. You don't have to move. Right. Um and you just sit there. And anyway, so I did stuff at his house. And then he was like, right, I'm going off to the States to go and, you know, uh, make records. And I'm going to go out there for a while. And I got a job. He got me a job, actually, at the townhouse, which is in London. Sadly closed now in Hammersmith in London. And it just kind of went on from there. You know, I just, I worked at there. I worked at the manor. Um, then I went on tour for a while in the States, which was brilliant. Um and then uh, I worked at Air Studios London, which is George Martin's studio, and then went freelance and just kind of went on from there. And Took off from there, right? So, I mean, the list of bands that you work with is in, is awesome. I mean, some of the, some of them are my top favorite bands: The Cure, <laughs> them, um, Depeche Mode. Uh, I got a chance to meet them actually when they were on tour in the United States. Oh, cool! Violator tour. So that was an album that we worked on, and I got yeah. to around. Okay, that was kind of. Cool. I wasn't there. I don't Not think really? okay. there. I don't know. No, because no, I went. I went on some of the. Um, I think. Uh, where did I go on the Violator tour? I think I went to two shows in the states. 
but then I was I was more kind of around during the album after that. Okay. Uh, live, um, particularly in Europe. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's happy accidents, and you you uh, you learn that you kind of make your own luck, you know. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. I, I believe one hundred percent. Having kind of been in the industry and been around it, you're right. It is a lot of just. I just happened to be there at the right time and get to meet certain people and. You know, yeah. if you if you take I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it it came through. There was a there is still a studio and it's beautiful. Uh, a place called the Church Studios, and it used to belong to Annie and Dave from Eurythmics. And um, basically, a friend of a friend of a friend of mine was the studio manager, and I'd come back off tour, and he offered me a job, and I was like, okay, that's cool. I ended up working with with Annie for a little bit and then Dave um, on film projects. And I did various bits and pieces there and Suzanne Vega and, you know, a few things. And then literally I got the phone call saying, you know, this band want to come in, they're called Depeche Mode. You know, they want you to do vocals with them. And I was like, no, you're kidding me. You know, I, was like, I don't want, I want to do rock music. I want to do this <laughs> electronics. What are you talking about? I had no idea. I mean, literally I had no idea. Um, so, uh, they, you know, the manager, you know, my friend said to me, he said, listen, you know, I think you should really do this because Flood's involved and, you know, it should be cool. So I was like, all right. And I loved it, you know, um, and I worked with them for about seven years, six, six and a half, seven years. I mean, you did some live you know, stuff with them. Um... Yeah, well, I, well, after the, after the, violator thing we're supposed to only be vocals but we ended up you know i i i, I did mix some b-sides and some of the instrumentals on the album but francois kavorkin came in who was um i think he's ang i think he's american french or something but he'd worked with Kraftwerk. oh wow so alan wilder was a big fan and you know i'm a fan of of, of craft work as well so he came in and mixed um and that was a very interesting experience. Um, and then they asked me, right, you know, we when Depeche go out live, they used to use a multi-reel tape machine, um, wow. you know, a 16-track, you know, Revox yeah. thing. So I spent about a month uh, with Alan, you know, reprogramming, or he, well, he was reprogramming and I was recording the stuff for live. So we did that. And then I went out and tour, did some stuff in the Violator tour and recorded some shows. And then, as I say, when I was in the States, I, I went to a couple of the gigs and then I did an album with Alan producing with uh, Nitzer Ebb. And then, you know, they called me back to do Songs of Eight and Devotion, um, which is a very long-winded story, mm -hmm. but was, was an excellent experience. And then we spent about another two and a half months reprogramming everything for the you know that that tour and i went out and recorded a number of gigs and um we did the which was going to be like a double live album of the whole faith and devotion tour but ended up cut down to being uh, the live versions of just the songs on songs of faith and devotion but then there was the video um that was um you know and the set design and brilliant brilliantly put together by anton corbin um so yeah, you know, it's good. <laughs> yeah. fond memories of that. Yeah, a lot of cool, cool bands that you worked with. Um, I see that you you also had a chance to work with Sir Paul McCartney. How did that come about? Um, well, I was um, I was all as I, said, I was on tour in the states, and then I kind of stopped in LA for a while because I, I, you know, um. I had met the guys from Berlin. Do you remember Berlin? Take my breath away. So I hooked up with them. And while I was there, um, I still had a work visa. So um, I was, you know, just did some freelancing in and out of studios because the SSL solid state console had come out, which was, you know, no one really knew what it was about in the States at the time. So, you know, I used to get calls to come and, show people how it worked and, you know, work on things like that. And I just got a phone call one day um, 
from another engineer friend of mine saying, listen, you know, there's a job opportunity at Air Studios London. You know, can you come and do an interview? So I was like, okay. So uh, I kind of left LA, went and did a, an interview there, got the job. And then um, McCartney, obviously, I mean, you know, he's associated with with George Martin is well known. So they were doing an out, al- he was doing an album at his own studio, which is in the south of England, in an old windmill, basically. He converted it. Wow. And they needed an assistant. So I was chosen to go down there. And I spent about three and a half months working on uh, God knows how many songs. Uh, a lot. <laughs> um, it's like, I mean, I imagine it had to be a little bit different than what you've experienced in the past. Um, I guess so. Cause I was such a big fan. I mean, I was a fan of the Beatles, a fan of, fan of McCartney's as well. I think I was more on the McCartney side than the Lennon side, no disrespect to anybody, but I just, I personally was more a fan with that kind of writing. And um, it was cool. You know, it, it, he's such a nice guy and, you know, you've made very welcome when we just kind of got stuck into it, really. You don't really think about it, to be honest. I know it's an odd thing to say, but, you know, I, I, the, the time that, that, that there, were, there were two things that stick out in my mind in particular. Um, one was, well, there's a few things, but anyway, the, the two things. Um, he knew, him and Linda knew my grandmother because oh, wow. my grandmother, my grandmother worked at a film studio where they'd done some movies. So he knew okay. her. And also I'd met him when I was 11 years old okay. because my grandmother called me and I went to the studios and she introduced me to Paul, you know, it was like, Oh, this is Paul. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and Linda and Danny Lane. And um, so that was cool. And they remembered that they remembered my grandmother, which was very sweet. Um, and uh, then another occasion, uh, where there was just Paul and I were in the studio. I don't quite know why it was just him and I, but anyway, the, the engineer had gone off somewhere and, you know, it's one of those kind of like end of session kind of days. And I can't quite remember, but he's sitting there and he's, we're playing through, he's doing some stuff on one of the songs and we, we just started chatting between the two of us. And, um, you know, he's like, oh, you know, where'd you go to school? And, you know, you know I'm a rugby fan and all this kind of stuff. And then he was like, oh, you know, uh, I remember he showed me his Hofner bass and it still had the last Beatles set list set of tape to the top of the bass. Remember that? And um, he was sitting down at the piano and he was like, well, you know, do you want me to play you a, shit, a song? What, you know, what, what song do you want? Kind of thing. You know, and he was, <laughs> I was like, okay, oh, I don't know. I don't, what about Fall on the Hill? You know, he's like, day after day, Lord on the Hill. You know, so that was cool. It was cool. And then we went to Abbey Road and did some strings on, on a couple of songs with George Martin, who I'd all re- I, I knew already from working at Air. But yeah, it was just, it was really nice. You know, what can I say? You know, very yeah. nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so I know the, the, the recording has changed a lot over the years. And like you've mentioned a, a bunch of times, um, recording in the box, recording in the box. Um, how has that affected you, um, the way that you uh, approach what you do as far as uh, your mixing approach, I should say? Are you still trying to uh, mix on large format consoles like an SSL um, when you have the opportunity? Or are you just trying to do everything? The, you got so used to being in the box that you're just there? I, I think that the, the, the fundamental change really... I mean, the obvious thing is going from analog to digital and then, you know, the, the advance in technology as far as, you know, converters and stuff and all this, that's fine. But the, the biggest change I've seen really is the amount of time that you have. So whereas, you know, you'd set up doing a mixing session, right? And you've got the SSL and it's 56 channels or you've got a Neve or you've got a whatever and you'd spend you know, two, three days mixing one tune, something, you know, and sometimes you do it and then you'd recall it all. So, you know, on the SSL with the screen and match up all the, all the, which was amazing at the time. Right. 
took a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you used to do it. And then, you know, you'd have like a big folder with notes. Mm-hmm. So every piece of equipment, you had a photocopy of it and you'd had every setting, you'd have to mark it down. It used right. to take a long time. But, um, but you know, the industry changed. Uh, finances changed. And the amount of money that was around changed which had a knock-on effect down to the people like us, you know, have to push buttons for a living. Right. And um, you just don't have the time. So, you know, when I'm mixing now, I do it in the box out of convenience because it, it, it does become convenient. But also because I don't have the opportunity or the budget to spend two days in a studio mixing a song. I just don't. You know the, the what I what I um or you know the, the 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 budgets are nowhere near what they used to be. That's understandable, um, but um, I it gives me the opportunity to be more flexible. To be honest, because you know you do something, you're working away, you've been at it for like you know six seven hours or whatever, you know, endless amounts of tea, lots of biscuits, you know, and you just think right, I've had enough. Um, and you go off and do something else. You, you close the session, save it, and you start something else. And you just refresh your head. Or as happens to me, you know, when I'm at home uh, in between, you know, domestic duties and one thing and another, I think, actually, I've got a couple of hours, you know, kids are in bed. I'll, I'll just do some work, right. which, of course, just simply wasn't possible before. Right, yeah. Um, so you, your day is structured. But it's basically been forced upon us, I think, whereas uh, – you know, um, guys or girls, guys and girls, excuse me, getting into, you know, the mixing and production now, to them it's, well, this is how it's done because they've never seen anything else. Sure. But th- those of us who, have, you know, been uh, been around for a bit longer, um, it's just adapting and trying to keep the principles of what you're trying to do fresh and not allowing the technology to stop you from doing that. Right, right. Um, basically, that's what I do. And, you know, it's great fun messing around with plugins, whereas I used to kind of do a daisy chain <laughs> on the desk and using, you know, dis- distorting a delay and then passing it into a phaser and, you know, doing all kinds of things. You just can't do that anymore. Um, because you, you don't have all that stuff knocking about, you know, but you can right. do it in the, in the computer, you know, yeah. it's cool. I think from a studio standpoint, it, it sure uh, cuts costs down a lot, you know, when you're not having to turn on all that gear and use all the gear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The electric, the electric bill is, is yeah. crazy when that, that bill comes. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember, you know, the old V3 console, the Neve V3, I mean, literally, you could fry eggs on that thing. It used to get so hot, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and now, I mean, a digital console, you only know it's there when the fan comes on, you know. It's yeah, like, you right <laughs> into the wall. Right. Yeah, it's, there you go. <laughs> you know, and there's um, – yeah, I mean, all, all I can say is, is is that, you know, it has its good and its bad sides, yeah. but I don't think you can get too hung up on the nostalgia – of how we used to work, you know, it is what it is. You do it this way, you adapt to it and you make, you use it to your own benefit. And I think um, you're able to do that a bit more uh, with the computer technology, the way it is now than you were with a studio years ago. I mean, yeah, you know, you're, you're able to be a bit more flexible, I think. I think um, it all. You're right. It, you're you're able to be more flexible, um, and I think the creative, um, the creativity for the artist doesn't get blocked or hindered because, as an engineer, we've got to set this up or set that up, and they've got to wait on that. And you know, sometimes creative, creative flow. You don't want to interrupt that creative flow. And mm. about from from my perspective is that you know digital world has allowed us to to move quickly and c- capture a lot of those creative ideas without losing them yeah. in the moment and then we can always go back and work on those ideas later you know really nail them down 
but mm. you know setting up a microphone or setting up a, a, a vocal chain isn't so difficult anymore because i'm not sitting at the patch bay you know patching everything and, and <laughs> yeah i used to call i like that but <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's fine I, I mean, what one thing I, I did i used to do a lot um and uh you don't really necessarily have to do that anymore, but I always used to have, um, you know, you know, okay. So you've got the old Leslie cabinet, right? So, you know, you know, the keyboard Leslie cabinet, huge thing. I always have, I used to have that in the live room set up on a send. So I used to send stuff out to that. Yeah. I used to, I used to send stuff out to, um, you know, the live room and record stuff. Um, and, uh, that was, you know, fun because you just kind of make up your own sounds and stuff, mm -hmm. but no, I used to, I used to do a lot of that stuff, which I, I think has been lost a little bit because you're so used to, um, just go, Oh, I'll try this plugin, you know, try this, plug it in and, and go. Whereas, you know, the adventure of, of happy mistakes, of which we, you know, we know a lot about, right? Yeah. Um, is always, I think, just part of the the fun. You know, I'm not saying that using plugins isn't fun, but you know, you just get oh, this plugin, oh, there's that preset, oh, that'll do, kind of thing. You know. Right. Whereas, right. you know, I'm I'm much more interested in you know making up my own sounds necessarily. You know. Yeah. Um, and I, I miss that side of it a little bit. But I can do that, you know, when I'm at my own studio, I, I can do that. Um, and just to create, just, you know, push the envelope a little bit more rather than just going to, you know, one plug-in and, as I said, just pulling down some presets, you know. Right. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the things that does uh, annoy me a little bit is when you've got a band, you know, a band in, and particularly, you know, a, a younger band, put it that way, who might not have as much recording experience um and may not be quite as skilled um they they think oh well yeah that's fine that'll do right uh, no <laughs> i don't I, I don't think you quite understood how this works yeah now, you go out there you do it again and the reason i want you to do it again is because i want you to do this this, this and this and i'll come out and stand there with you you know like in front of the drummer or something and you know, or they, they, they kind of, because they've got a, and a, a knowledge of the computer software. So they think, Oh, you know, you can just put it in time. You can just, you know, tune it. You can do this or, you know, right. like to me, um, setting a steady click of one BPM for the whole track is like, that's not how music works. Sorry. You know, going back, you know, into, into, you know, recordings or pre pre recordings going back into into um, classical music from years ago. You know, they never used to do that. Right. You know, it always used to speed up and slow down. That's half the thing of it. You know. So I I like I like to when I'm working with a with a band a rock band and, and they want you know um, I I let them record without the click and then I'll go okay right well this is kind of how it moved so let you I'll work the click out. You know, I'll speed it up, slow it down, and you follow that. You know, it's all kind of bits and pieces, you know. But uh, yeah, it's just yeah. that the musicians have kind of a little bit lazy, I think. I I, I agree one hundred percent. And you're right. They, the, the the fact that they've got some knowledge about the software and the equipment that yeah. we use and the plugins that we use, um, a lot of terminology is thrown around without a not a lot of uh, insight of what those words are that they throw around. That's one of the uh, the things that we encounter a lot. Or we do a lot of hip hop. Um, mm. it's that's a, that's a different kettle of fish, though, isn't it? You know, it's like that, doing that kind of. That's yeah. that's a different kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's a, com a completely different type of thing. But I mean, it seems to be trans transferring over into the rock world with the bands. Mm. Um, it, it, it's just you know the we have a engineer here who uses the 60 take rule <laughs> with the artist it's like you know if you can't get you we it's got to be somewhere in 60 takes but we're not going to do like two takes and uh you know one thing that i've been doing a lot is 
interviewing my clients before I actually book them to determine, you know, where they're at in their craft and what their metric is for um, what they're coming in to do. If they want to book a few hours to do something, I want to know what your ex- your expect your expectation met- metric is to see yeah. if it fits along with what I do. Yeah. And, you know. And- I, 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 I think I do a very similar kind of thing. Particularly when when it when someone asks me, they call me up and they want to mix something. I think, um, let me say it's just a little bit different. But when it's a band that want to come in record, and certainly a band that I don't know, or then definitely it's kind of like, okay, you come in and do a rehearsal at my studio. Please don't play with that, Donnie. Just leave it. Um, you come in and do, and do a rehearsal, then uh, you know I'll sit there, give you a few nods, and then I'll tell you what I think we can get out of what you're doing right? and see how good you are. I mean, I, I worked, um, this is uh, the classic, uh, I think it's coming into our vocabulary now. So uh, pre COVID time, <laughs> <laughs> um, I worked with this band called our propaganda and they came in through a manager friend of mine um, and uh, they came in and blew me away because the level of musicianship that they had, or they have, I was really impressed by. So I, that was easy. I was like, okay, you know, song wise, we need to work, you know, the structures and blah, blah, blah. But the, the cap- your capability to kind of take on board some of my suggestions, which I, they're only suggestions, you right. know, I'm not telling you what to do here, but I think that perhaps this is the other, you know, I knew was going to land on fertile ground. Right. Whereas other bands, you just know, just like you guys are just not ready to come in and record, you know. And I've had it on a couple of occasions where they tell me, "Yeah, but you know, we went to so and so studio and they did it." I was like, "Okay, well, you can go back there if you want, <laughs> but I am not going to sit in this chair for two days trying to piece together a drum track, or you want to play a bass line and you, you, I can't, you, you." your musician skills are not strong enough to take on board any other suggestions apart from what you know that you can play. Right. And then you're expecting me then to put that in time and, and it, no, I don't think we're on the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it, it, it kind of, you know, you're shooting yourself in the foot to a degree, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, someone walks out of your studio, someone goes somewhere and it's got your name on it. Exactly. And, that to me still counts a lot, not because I'm trying to, you know, brush myself up here, but you know, you want someone to go, Oh, we went in, you know, we sat with Mike, we had a brilliant time, you know, uh, he helped us and we developed and we feel we came out stronger. That's what you want. Yeah. Right. Uh, we don't want to sit there for four days trying to piece together a guitar track. Yeah. To you make know? it sound better than what they really are. And yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, the venues are going to get mad at us because <laughs> we made them. Yeah, yeah. And they get right. up and they're nothing. They, they, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, they, and it's all part of the learning curve that, um, as I say, the, the, re, the reduced amount of time, the reduced amount of budget to allow, you know, the bands just, they're not getting signed. So they're not getting money from anywhere else. They're funding things on their own. Um, and we have to adapt to that, obviously. But you can't just, allow people to just go okay we'll come in for a few hours and then you put it together i'm yeah. not doing that no. <laughs> no i mean i cut my yeah. teeth that way and, and that's understandable but at some point you have to you know you have to have some standards and uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's like I, standards too <laughs> you know but but I, I i find that you know with me uh, you know i'm sure it's the same way with you you know you you're you adapt to people you want to work with them you want to make them you want to help them, mm-hmm. but you also, it's like doing your kids homework. You know, your kids have got to make mistakes. They've got to understand that they're not, they're not perfect and that they're not going to get everything right. And, you know, we're not going to win every time, are we? So when, once you've, you allow them to get on it and, and make a mistake and then find out what went wrong, they get better next time. That's the theory anyway. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, um, 
I'm not going to keep you too too much longer. I'm just going to uh, kind of end it here with a, a last question. Uh -huh. um, what advice or what, if you've been watching this podcast, you should get all the advice out of it. But um, say say somebody who's just getting involved as an engineer producer coming out of like one of the schools that they teach them how to do that. Do you have any advice for for them? I don't know what to look out for or, you know, I mean. I, I, I would say that one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable part of what we do, it sounds strange, uh, is experience. And you and I both know you, you, you're never going to stop learning. And I know, you know it sounds very cliché but it's so true. You, it doesn't matter what's written in a piece of paper. It doesn't matter what technical um, theories you might have been taught. The best way to learn is by doing it. Right. And yes, you make mistakes. And yes, it can be frustrating because you, you know, you're, you're trying to mix it. Go, Why does it sound so terrible? You know, I can't get my head around it. Um, and eventually your natural skills will take over and, and you will learn how to how to rectify those mistakes with the help of others obviously mm -hmm. but you've got to get your hands dirty you know you've you somehow you know i started i didn't start off by you know um being an engineer or you know then falling into you know co-producing or whatever you know i started off by making sandwiches <laughs> You know, you make bad sandwiches, they're not going to call you back. You know, it's right. like, <laughs> and it's like, you know, Flood, uh, and, you know, uh, to those who don't know who Flood is, but very well known English producer. And I'm a fan of his. I've been lucky enough to work together with him. But he got his name by making a lot of tea. That's how he got his name, you know, and it, it sounds daft, but it is so true. He was willing to put in the hours, sit there and watch what went on. Um, as I as I did with 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 Glyn, for example, and I learned a lot from him just by watching. Sometimes not really understanding what he was doing, but I was like, oh, okay, you know. And then taking that on, um, I think there's far too much, you know, in these schools. I think there's far too much theory and not enough practice. I agree, a hundred percent. You know, and. Um, uh, I wish that in my day that, that, that there'd, there'd been, you know, a few more places that I could have gone to uh, to learn a bit more before I started in studios. I was just very fortunate mm -hmm. that I got picked up and I was thrown in literally at the deep end. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you've got all the opportunities, you know, to, to work at home as well. You know, it doesn't take that much, you know, but so it, Experience is uh, is key. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, it's it's the the trouble is is that we were very fortunate. I think that you know we were able to um, gather that experience because that's how the world ran at that time. Right now, trying to get you know, I get emails from people all the time. You know, is there any space at your studio? Can I come along? And I was like, well. I don't really need anyone. I, I, you know, yes, if I'm doing a big session, you can come in and, you know, you can stand and watch and help if you want, you know. Um, but uh, if that's it, just trying to get your hands dirty as much as possible, you know. Uh, 21 Pilots, you, you look at those guys, you know. It's, I'm a big fan of, of what, they, what they've done and, you know, their past before they became well-known, which I found, about, found out about later. But there it goes. Look at this. He learned how to write songs by doing it by doing it yeah coming up with some great ideas and you know it wasn't the best sounding album in the world but it rocked yeah you know for, for all kinds of reasons you know mm -hmm. um so there's there's I, I learned from that i was like oh brilliant you know so i, I was in in rehearsals not long ago and um you know i recalled the rehearsals now on, on my on my phone and i remember talking to the drummer and I said to him, actually, you know what? It sounds pretty good in here. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna record some of the drum tracks on 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 my phone just to have them behind, you know, where eventually when we go into my studio. Um, I don't know, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but it, it sounded good. Why not? You know, 
So I've I've got an individual sound. It didn't come out of a box. It came out of something organic, you know. Okay, yeah. From um, this area. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it'll work. We'll see, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, anyway. they're definitely um, an, a local influence for myself, actually, um, when they came out and how they just came out onto the scene and the way that they marketed themselves and the way that yeah. they, they went from what seemed to be zero to 100, you know, overnight. Yeah. But very cool. people didn't realize all the work that they had put in to getting to that point. Well, that, that was the thing that interested me because we know that it's not that simple. Sometimes it can be, but it's very, very rare. And so you look back into the past of, 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 of those kind of projects. Um, and they're one of, a, one of a number of bands that have done that. And good luck to them. Right, right. You know? Well, man, it's been awesome catching up with you. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. It's been good. It's it's uh, about time, right? <laughs> about time. It's been, what, 10 years or something like that? Yeah. Uh, wow, has it been that long? Bloody hell. Well, have you been uh, to, to the States, to Dan's new spot? That you built? Actually, I went there. Um, when was the last time I... He was still working up on the in the hills okay. uh, at the old place. Um but I went to the new place and when it was being built. Okay. Actually. Uh, so he what hadn't yet moved around, probably. Probably. I, You know what? I, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember when he, he told me he would bought it and we kind of, I think we drove past it once and he said, Oh, it's that over there. And then, you know, I went into it and they were kind of doing the kitchen upstairs or something. And yeah. The, yeah. The basic layout he put together. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I, there's an entrepreneur for you. You know, got to admire it, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, that's he's my mentor. He's yeah. the one that I've learned from. You know, and it's it's been a blessing to learn from him, um, and to see his his finally getting some recognition. Um, yeah, on some bigger records, and I yeah. see Andy Wallace has been out there a few times working on some records with him, and yeah, it's really cool to see that. You know, and you know, yeah, I, absolutely, I, yeah this place and you know how, how how did you find dan i mean he found me he found you yeah i i was uh, i remember very well i was out in germany uh, um mixing recording uh blimey when was that it's got to be like 2003 or four maybe okay i can't quite remember and um i just got the you know a uh, a uh, 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 a message i think my manager called me or something he said oh this guy in the states wants to talk to you i was like okay and danny called me and um okay I, how did i hear the songs now i can't even remember if he sent me a tape or he sent me something or i can't remember but um of his band with a girl singer uh the first incarnation with emmy emmy was it yeah, yeah emmy was the singer yeah and um and i was like okay and he was like yeah you know i really like to work with you i want you to come to my studio i've got my own studio i was like hey why not you know um so i was i remember i was in the states probably working with mr north i think and then i went over to his studio and it's like wow this location's amazing love the studio loads of great gear really nice guy you know um why not yeah. You know? Um, and then I, I did, I did a few things there. Yeah. Um, and I, I loved it, you know, but I haven't had the opportunity to work at the new place, which, you know, looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah. Electorville is so man. Yeah. You can imagine. <laughs> yeah. If he hasn't got a wind farm by now, he needs one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking time to come on my podcast. Um, no problem. I'm going to do some editing of the video and stuff. And uh, Yeah. Um, Sorry about the interruptions. Oh, no worries. Uh, that's, Just a bit, that's, bit tired, I think. No big deal. She's actually, she's actually fallen asleep on my lap. <laughs> well, I appreciate <laughs> it. I'll let you know when the video is up. and you know It'll probably be up on YouTube and some of the other platforms like that. Um, okay, man. Yeah. Um, I'll let you know, and let's stay in touch, you know? 
Do you yeah, man, let's do that. Yeah, but thank you so much for reaching out, man. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to see you. Yeah. Have a chat. Yeah. Take care, buddy. We'll take care. We'll see you soon. All right, man. All right, buddy. Cheers. Bye.